Welcome to Keynotes. This is a special edition where I speak to several keynotes about filmmaking. My name is Nisha Rogers. I'm your host right now. I'm accompanied by Tahir Dudier, Isaac Dietz, Sean Michael Craig, and Lauren Pesky. Welcome to the show. I want to start the show off with an icebreaker. Okay. All right, mm -hmm. imagine you're stranded on an island. Mm -hmm. You're going to be there for at least three years. Let's say that. Three years. Okay? Mm. But you do have access to a film, one film only, mm. that you have to play on repeat. What is that film? I wanted to say Castaway. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. That's a good one. I'm kidding about that. Your oh, ultimate man. favorite film that you could have in rotation? Hmm. I think I'm going to say Inception. I feel like Shawshank Redemption would be Ooh. hopeful. Oh, and like keep my spirits up. That or Seven, but I think that would take me out. <laughs> the ending every time. Yeah, I just really like the cinematography. <laughs> That's cool. Man, I, I don't know. I think I have a three-way tie between The Mummy or The Matrix or Tenet because I don't understand it after seeing it so many times. And maybe in three years I'll get it. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's been uh, I was thinking about The Sound of Music because it's always a classic, always epic. And there is something, there's, you know, there's drama, there's music, there's lightness, but there's also heart. Mm -hmm. Or maybe Pride and Prejudice, Joe Wright's Pride and Prejudice, because it's one of my favorites, or Jurassic Park. So I, I am curious to know, because all of you all are in the filmmaking industry, when did you first learn that I am in fact in love with film? Was it an isolated moment that you can recall where you first found your love for film and filmmaking? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll start. Yeah, um, um, yeah. I, man, for me, it was in college. Uh, I was studying film. It was maybe my second or third year in, like right when I got out of like you know those entry level classes, and um, got to experience uh, doing a summer feature film project, mm. and um, and it was the first time I was able to like really kind of just dig my feet and like like into something long term, um, and not really have to worry about anything else like you know because the hectic school schedule um, and I just distinctly remember like where nothing else existed but that film because I, I was DPing that film at the time and um, you know so it was like a really you know you know I was kind of like the center of like the crew morale and like you know specifically on this team um, so like um, yeah I just the film was the only thing that existed and I just kind of put my complete self into it and I was like totally okay with it. Mm -hmm. Like I was just so happy, you know, just to be like immersed into this thing, you know, I mean, it's long nights, you know, really, you know, long um, break break days and something, you know, um, I mean, rap days and stuff like that, but I just didn't care, you know? And um, and I just kind of seen my my life follow suit, you know, and just like, you know, when you, start, when you see certain things like that, like, you know, the people in your life and like the things that you're doing in your life kind of just start to wrap around those those things that you care about. It just to me made sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you, Lauren? Oh, um, so I would say like the, my gateway drug film would be Jurassic Park. Mm. Um, it, it just was one of the first times that I had really been transported into another world and it was fascinating and it was real it, it seemed so real i loved the characters and i think i watched that film over 50 times <laughs> um <laughs> so that was something that made me interested in doing film but i didn't i was more focused on theater for a long time and i think the first time i actually made a short film because i was an electrician at the time and i thought i don't know what to do like i don't know where i want to go with this um, and I decided to make a short with some of my other friends who were on set and that was when I fell into it, kind of the same as you, where I just went, oh, oh, this is it. Like this feels like home behind the camera here, watching this happen, putting all these pieces together and seeing this puzzle come to life. 
Mm. I can relate to that exact experience. Um, I was, so growing up, we would always have TBS on on Sunday, and you'd watch like these different movies. I don't know, I'm just a sucker for like these great action movies that have heart. So I would always, mm -hmm. my, me and my dad would always watch these movies together on a Sunday afternoon, folding laundry together. And this is just what our Sundays were, the afternoons. But like, I picked up a camera and I was shoot, doing photography for some time, but then I somehow someone says, can you shoot this music video for me? I was like, oh, okay, I'll try it. And walking on set, not knowing what to do at first, and then it just something clicked like, oh, this needs to come first, then this, then that, then we need this. And it just all made sense to me and I felt comfortable and I felt like I knew what I was doing. And it came out great. Well, as great as the first music video can be. Yeah. But um, <laughs> it, was, it was just that sense of I'm at home in this, in this space. And like I can rel really relate to what you mentioned there. I think showing something I made to a live audience was where it was like this, I'm in for the rest of my life. I, I bought a toy camera when I was like 11. And I made a, a few skits, like short film kind of stuff, and just had my friends and family like kind of gather. And just hearing them laugh when I wanted them to, I was like, <laughs> this, this is the rest of my life. I don't know if I fully ever fell in love with filmmaking, but I fell in love with the making of films. Mm. I think for me, I realized my love for movies and, and love for film in general was watching Titanic for the first time oh. and then Classic. spending another three hours watching the making of yeah. Titanic. Mm. And you know, all the family leaves. When the movie goes off, you remember with DVDs, they mm -hmm. give you the movie and then they give you that extra, I miss those. that yeah. bonus disc. <laughs> and I just remember like everybody leaving and I'm like, let me just see what this is about. And then sitting there for like another three hours watching how James Cameron came up with all of that stuff. I was like, okay, I'm the only one sitting here. This is another <laughs> level of like <laughs> love for film. I'm curious to know if any of you have a philosophy when it comes to filmmaking. Yeah, I, um, I like to ascribe to the three E's, which are, is it effective, is it effusive, and are we being efficient? Mm -hmm. So I look at that efficiency more for the set side and making sure that our storytelling is efficient so that it can be effective and evoke the emotions that we want from people and keep them involved and just, that's why we tell a story mm. is to make you feel something <laughs> in a weird yeah. way yeah. Yeah. no for real and uh, you know and when you're speaking to the audience you know it's a, it's really important to just address your why um, and that's kind of like why uh, where I set a lot of my decision making um, when when um, designing a, a, a film or you know going into a film um, you know I kind of use that to navigate the, the reasoning um, you know and help that make decisions you know because at the end of the day we're servicing the community and um, and we always have to keep the community in which we're servicing in mind when creating the project you know uh, because all those little things that uh, you know speak directly to the community they'll appreciate you know and um, and the more tapped in you are with it the 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 more potent I think the product will be mm -hmm. um, and um, and yeah and you know at the end of the day we're, we're servicing the community we're community servants so we, you know we should follow suit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of community that makes me think because Isaac you I, I really respect what you do because you are very very tapped into like making sure that the community is involved in filmmaking starting mm -hmm. with Thunderdome and kick the ladder can you talk a little bit about the inception of that and why that's been so important to you yeah um so when i got into filmmaking when i was like a kid i bought a toy camera and i started making films with my friends and then i moved to atlanta in 2009 and i started making fit or meeting fit industry people and being like let's make a film and they're like how much you pay me and i'm like i want to work on my craft i want to be able to practice this mm -hmm. so i started a film house called the thunderdome and we do like events there for the past decade since 2010 um and we just at first like you know projected the films onto like a white bed sheet outside or whatever and just filled it out and got um like standing room only for a long time and then uh in 2019 which is how we met is um i started a filmmaking game called kick the ladder where you roll dice and it gives you two rules to make a one minute film in one week. So every week we'd roll the dice and you'd get like, you know, two locations and you have to, you know, include a shot with 1148, you know, like a clock reading 1148 or, you know, like three people could work on it and all handheld. 
and so you have one minute or one week to make a one minute film. So since we've created that, uh, we've made over 1,700 films that have all been played live in front of a live audience. What? Um, this is really this cool. This is all, yeah. People have submitted from all over the world. Um, wow. And what's really cool, we've had 12-year-old girls make their first feature film, or first short film, to 72-year-old men. Um, like everything in between mm. because film is now getting more accessible to like individual expression mm -hmm. um, but then also I s I'll uh, end with this but basically film isn't 150 years old yet so if film was music we haven't discovered punk rock and hip hop yet mm. and so we're still in the orchestra phase where you, to make a song you need 80 people to agree to play that song where if you're going through a breakup, you, sometimes you want to just be at the piano and play. Mm -hmm. You just want to express your emotions. Yeah. So I don't think film is there yet. I don't think film has actually gotten to a place where it's like folk music. Mm -hmm. It's still in the orchestra, but it's like where it's one person's voice coming out. Like there's no Kendrick Lamar film yet <laughs> because it's like that's such a like one voice mm. um, coming out of you know an art form. Film is just such a new medium of art. When you think about film being an art form, is it strictly an art form or do you think there is a science to filmmaking? Oh, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. there's an absolute craft. You have to have yeah. a craft. Yep. I think you can have every single creative idea in the world mm -hmm. and if you don't know how to execute yep. it, it's not going to happen. Totally. And you can, there's so many ways to learn that craft, mm -hmm. but it's such a combination of creative and technical and it's just, they, they can't be exclusive of one another. They're, they, they're a team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think the other end of that is like mm -hmm. the, the storyline too, because cause, you know, I think the flip end to it is if you don't have that tech and a background experience to like, you know, fully accomplish it at its best of its capabilities, like, you know, your storyline just has to be solid. Mm -hmm. You know, a good story, you know, because, uh, you know, I, I'm first generation American. Um, my, my family is from Haiti. And, you know, growing up watching a lot of Haitian films, it's really bad, you know, but my whole family would crowd around the TV to watch it. Yeah, I agree. And, and it's not because they're, you know, watching, jumping into, you know, high-end Hollywood um, film, but it's just a good story. You know, yeah. a lot of them were yeah. love, love quarrels and things like that, but it's like, that will, that's enough to keep people going, yeah. especially now in today's world, too, where, um, you know, I, like you were saying earlier, which I think is really profound, that, you know, we're still a, a young medium. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think with that, you know, we have, like you said, the new filmmakers with phones that are, like, doing things that aren't traditional, but you know are effective in some mm -hmm. cases um, you know so there is like a like a toss-up there yeah kind of mm -hmm. it's cool right it's cool that the technology allows for so many new voices yeah. and like people that would have a harder time getting their stories out there if we were still on these big film cameras where you have to process the film and you have to you know and you did have to have a lot more technical knowledge mm -hmm. so I think the stories coming out are really interesting and unique and all that but of course I think to your point if you don't have a good story, yeah. you don't have any, I don't you know, care how yeah. technically beautiful it is, mm -hmm. you need your good story. Are you completely fulfilled if your film is not seen? Hmm. Is the story making process fulfilling if no one sees it? By no one, you mean no one? Because I, I definitely want a few close friends to see it. That, sure. That's, a you know, film's not complete until somebody sees it, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. In fact, like seeing an audience respond to the ways that I wanted them to respond, that's what informs like, okay, this is working, this is not working, tweak this a little bit more. Um, I have a few films I made that I've only shown to like eight people and just never posted online, just been, like going through a breakup kind of thing, really personal but showed it to a few, and it's like some of my favorite stuff, but it's just like, that's mine. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad, I, I will always show everything I make to somebody, but mm -hmm. to have it not get seen by millions, for sure, yeah. It's, it's still fine. fulfilling. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll speak to this. Um, there's something cathartic about just making something, mm -hmm. in my opinion, and I, I, I do this a lot. I make something and I never, it just sits on my computer and no one will ever find it. Mm -hmm. and, and it's okay for me because it was just the process of making the thing itself mm -hmm. did something for me. I will say this though, um, at the South by Southwest thing where it was screened, 
it was an amazing experience to have a group of people just respond to something you made. Yeah. It is it did something to me like that was changed my whole experience about filmmaking. I don't know if I can do that solo, put it on a, on a drive and let it just sit there forever and again, ever again. Right. Because it just like, oh, they laughed at that moment. I didn't expect that or I did expect that. Mm -hmm. And it's just like it's just that human response is great. I also want you guys to kind of talk about the different facets of what you do in film and speak to the level of, I guess, dedication that it takes to the craft individually. Mm -hmm. Tahir, we'll start with you. Oh, well, I mean, it sounds important, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you gotta be able to hear what you're watching, you know? So, so it's important to make sure that it sounds good. And, um, and you know, a lot of the unspoken things that sound does, um, you know, on set and how it, you know, is important to the filmmaking process is, first of all, we are set the time of the day. You know, um, sound is the, the keeper of time. You know, uh, we, we, we set the time code for, for all the cameras, um, set the time code for the slate. And, you know, and, you know, once that thing is once the film is recorded and put on a hard drive those time signatures is what the editor will use to edit the piece you know so all those things have to match and that's just like you know one of the first things that the sound person does on set um, is just kind of set that time code of the day um, you know and you know there's tons of nuances that you know make it complicated you know and, and you know and there's a lot of things that you know we have to do just working closely with actors um, you know and talent um, uh, uh, as well as just kind of setting a, a precedence of like because there's a lot of uh, personalities on set <laughs> you know and and you know and sound you know I think it's important for us to kind of be the grounding nature of the of the work environment you know because we're one of the few people on set that's just paid to listen mm. you know um, and and I think it's important to do that sometimes and especially in the creative space because you know because um, as you know as we we've all I'm sure here have experiences like you know we could be doing one thing on set but you know, it's very quick where a hat is thrown on you, you gotta do another thing on set. Or or maybe you're on set and it's your it's your job to only do one thing and but you have an ideas on how this, you know, things can go differently on set. You know, you have to be able to like internalize that and still put that somewhere, you know. Um, and and sometimes it takes, you know, just taking that time to listen and um, finding your pockets. To, to you know voice these ideas um, to, to make things roll so so you know we you know I, I, I do a lot of things on set you know um, but but mainly you know I just try to make sure that things sound good what about for you Isaac yeah so I'm writer director so I think a big role of a director is to not only like just steer the moving ship and let everyone know all the information they need to do their job well but also like I think um, you have a really um, important job of like tone setting for the, sh the set too if people are going to do like vulnerable things like especially acting and stuff to just make them feel like they can be vulnerable and it will be respected and, and revered in a certain way so when they're done crying they could still like you know come down and it's not like you know just moving them like cattle or something like that mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. sean well so i'm a cinematographer i do that i make beautiful images that's my job but more than making something look good, it has to feel right for the story. So if it's something that has to feel heavy and dark, it has to look heavy and dark. Mm -hmm. It has to match the tone of what's going on in the script and what the director wants. So that's basically what I do. And Lauren, I think what you do is also very interesting because you don't usually hear about a lot of women being in, in the electric department, doing lighting and stuff, and then you know turning into directing. Can you kind of speak to that kind of path that you've been on? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I'm actually very happy that that was the path I went down. I know it's not a normal path, but it gave me a huge respect for what the crew does um, and, and from actual experience rather than just looking at it. And, and I have a sense of how much time things take, what it takes to get something done. Um, and that goes back to that craft aspect of being in the trenches with everyone, knowing like what the key light is, what the fill light is, what happens, how the set moves, because mostly in TV for me, it's, it's a machine. Mm -hmm. Those sets will not slow down for anyone. Mm -hmm. 
and you better know how to work within it, mm -hmm. especially if you want to get any of your creative vision into that episode. Um, so it's it was very helpful. I got to work with a lot of amazing people. I've same as you, Tahir, like watching people and, and learning from people and seeing these amazing DPs and these amazing directors, also seeing the things that I went, wow, that's not working so well. <laughs> like you not prepping your stuff, mm. not working out. You yeah. know, you being disrespectful to the crew, not working out. Like I just see how much crew morale and respect for the crew will help you get your project made, no matter what it is. I, I also see that every, so many people, out, I can't say every single person, but the majority of people on film sets are artists in their own way. Mm -hmm. And so as a director, I feel like one of my jobs is to take everyone's great ideas and filter them. So it's like, I'm the keeper of the story, right? And at the end of the day, I need it to match the tone. I need to know that, you know, everything is serving the story, whether it's the shot, you know, do we want a simple shot? Do we need a complicated shot? Um, what is all going to serve the story the best? And so, but when you create that environment, to what Isaac was saying, where people feel heard and they feel safe, like not just the actors, but the crew, where they can voice those ideas. I mean, I've had camera operators come up to me and say, hey, can I pitch you something? I'm like, yeah, go for it. And they've shown me this shot that I was like, wow, yeah. this is so beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. It's mine now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, great. You know, I mean, that's the thing. It's best idea wins. Mm -hmm. And when you create that environment on set, I just think you get a much better finished product. And also, we're all there for so many hours mm -hmm. in the day. It's like, this is the greatest job in the world. And I don't want to be miserable at work. I don't want anyone else to be miserable at work. Like, you become this family. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I mean, I think what Isaac said is so perfect. It's just, it is a huge part of my job to communicate what I want, what we need, um, and to bring everybody in on that, make everybody feel safe, set the tone, and keep the story. What do you guys think is the measure of success when it comes to a good film? What makes a film good? Sean, I'll start with you. Cool, because I have something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was a lie, I have nothing. I'm kidding, I do have something. Um, no, I think what makes a film successful in my mind is that it resonates with the audience watching it, to me. Mm -hmm. um, I think it could be great if it makes a lot of money, it could be great if it um, gets a lot of accolades, but I think the most important piece of filmmaking to me is that it resonates with the audience watching it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's, that's all I got. That's good. I always say uh, success like tied to goals, so it just depends on what the goal is. Mm -hmm. So if a filmmaker decides to make an experimental film to understand or explore a certain idea, and that will you know, carry on to like five years later and they could put that into a film, then I would say that's successful even if nobody saw it or didn't resonate, or, but it's like going after their goal. Or if somebody's like, I want to see if I can make enough money to pay my bills from this film just so I can do my art stuff. Like I'll make some dog food commercials to pay some bills. That's success because it's like going after the goal. So I think it all depends on the goal mm. of the specific filmmaker making it. Before we go, I want to ask you all, film you wish you made. Lauren, we'll start with you. Oh boy. <laughs> um, in a way, I, I hate to say that any of the films I love, I wish I had made because there's a reason I love them and that filmmaker did such a great job. Uh, I would love to make Lord of the Rings <laughs> or something along those lines because I love epics like that and fantasies. Sean? Probably Star Wars and I think I would do, now, I'm going to get some hate on this one, but episode three, not the rest of them. Not yeah. the rest of them. Yeah, just, just episode three. Okay. I feel like Christopher Nolan's sets seem like the most fun. I really love directing extras. Like, that's like an addiction for oh. me. Maybe oh. it's a power thing, I don't know, but I love it. Uh, so when I see it's behind the scenes, when he has like a thousand people running down the street, I'm like, that's, that looks a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Man, that's, that's, that's it. Wow. You guys got some good ones. Um, all right, so I think the, 
I would. I'm gonna switch it up here. I would. I would make a film. I would like to make the last Airbender film. Mm. Over and that's because I in no hate, but like I wasn't the biggest fan of the way that it was put together. I have a guilty confession. I've never seen Star Wars. <gasps> oh, I, I know. I, I, cut I, I, know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I've never seen it. What is it you about? Know, no. Yeah, yeah. no, no, no. You know, I really I haven't it. seen it. But you know why I haven't seen it now to this day is because I like this reaction. No, yeah. I, I didn't until like four I'm purposely ago. not seeing it. Now this yeah. is an opportunity. <laughs> this is your this is opportunity. The <laughs> okay, okay. I'll, I'll look into it as we as we get ready to as we get ready to close because I do want to thank you guys for coming on. Really quick, fill in the blank. I'm a storyteller because why, Tahir? I'm a storyteller because my family needs one. Mm. Isaac? Uh, yeah, to discover myself. Sean? Because I love it. Uh. I'm a storyteller because I couldn't do anything else with my life. Mm. And with that note, we'll close. <laughs> Keep making films. <laughs>